were just tuned in with DJ Antonio Caesar for the sixth annual Green Team Summit. You're one and only DJ. Check me out on Instagram, Facebook, anything, Spotify, Apple Music. But I would like to pass it to Princess Harris today for an official welcoming to our third day in our third workshop. Princess, the mic is yours. Welcome to our racial healing session. Session. My name is Princess Harris and I'm, I am Faith in Place, the Sustainable Food and Land Use Coordinator. I am especially excited to welcome you to this session on racial healing. So much of the brokenness we experience in the United States is rooted in racism and our history of slavery. We all witnessed the pain of George Floyd's murder, which shook our country a year ago, and was only one of the thousands of instances of deep pain caused by our racial divide. This divide is also seen in how climate change impacts communities, which calls us to work for climate justice and not solutions to climate change that overlook how communities of color bear the greatest burden of our warming planet. We will explore this idea more after exploring together the practice of a racial healing circle. Tonight, we hope this space will, will be one of healing and compassion, or as author Isabel Winkerson said, says, describes of radical empathy. She talks about radical empathy in her book, Cast, as putting in the work to educate oneself and to listen with a humble heart to understand another's experience from their perspective not as we imagine we would feel. We hope to create a protective space where we can feel that. Thank you to our summit headline sponsor, NRDC, and this session sponsor, Illinois Environmental Council, for making tonight possible. You can meet all our sponsors and summit partners on our website, greenteamsummit.org. I also want to remind you that you can win a $100 gift card to Earth Hero, an online marketing working to create a healthier planet by completing our sponsor passport and our summit survey. Learn more through the link in the chat. Tonight's sessions and all sessions this week are being recorded and will be available along with all the resources shared after the summit on greenteamsummit.org. Now I would like to introduce Dan Hutchinson, Faith in Place of Chicago, North and West Suburb Outreach Director for our land acknowledgement. Thank you, Princess. Good evening, I'm Dan Huncha, and I'm looking forward to experiencing racial healing with each of you this evening. This land acknowledgement will recognize native people from the Illinois area. But if you are joining from elsewhere, we invite you to check out the resource linked in the chat to learn about the native communities on whose land your home resides. Faith in Place works throughout the current state of Illinois, which is comprised of the ancestral lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Miami, Maskutin, Meskwaki, Odawa, Piankasha, Wea, Sauk, Potawatomi, Kickapoo, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. These nations were forcefully removed from their homeland and fight to survive and maintain their identity. We strive to acknowledge and address the violence and colonization in which our modern society is rooted. And now I turn it over to Isioma Odom, Faith in Place's Energy and Climate Change Coordinator, who will guide us through the rest of this racial healing session. Thank you, Dan. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. So I want to welcome you know everyone to this protective space. My name is Isiyama Odom. I'm the Energy and Climate Change Coordinator at Faith in Place, and I also conduct racial healing circles in my spare time. Um, I would like to take a moment to talk about what racial healing circles are, why they're important, and what role they can play in our lives. So what is a racial healing circle? My hope and desire is to generate and author questions that both engage our bodies, hearts, and souls, as well as help you to relate and connect to your identity and who you are at this moment in time. Our identity is connected to how we see ourselves, how we connect with others, and how we establish our purpose and our vocation. So racial healing circles are an experience, a tool to be used to connect people uh, who may feel isolated or unseen. Um, it's also to assist in fostering trust and building authentic relationships that bridges the gaps between us. 
So it is essential to pursue racial healing circles um, prior to doing change making work in communities. Before we do the policy work, we have to uh, do the people work. And in order to do the people work, we must understand their stories and so that we can help uplift their voices. So there are three things that I want us to keep in mind um, tonight. And one of them is a sense of agency. Um, for those of you who are participating in the circle or who are observing the circle, um, because you're here right now and that's the first step. Uh, number two is identity impact. So how did this action tonight and this participation make you feel? Did it make you feel powerful or liberated or visible or seen? And then number three, what happened as a result of this experience? So what can you take away? What are the things that can assist you in your healing journey outside of this protective space? So Ray, Carla, Cindy, Veronica, and Dan, they're going to uh, be kind of the examples of what this racial healing circle can look like tonight. So they're gonna be modeling the circle. And those of you who are watching, uh, you can participate uh, by either journaling um, in responses to the questions or uh, putting your responses in the chat. Um, tonight is about sharing stories. So please don't hesitate to share, although you are not required to. Um, do what's most comfortable for you. Um, and so we're going to uh, ask a set of questions to the Faith in Place staff here tonight that are participating in the circle. Um, and then we're going to have time for um, reflection. Um, and I'm going to prompt you when it's time, um, speakers, to stop speaking. Because one of the things I want us to remember tonight is to actively listen. So we're going to give each other enough time to be able to answer the question. If you finish the question before your minutes are up, then um, just sit in silence for the remainder of the time. Um, and then we will prompt the next person to speak. Uh, we're going to now jump into uh, centering ourselves. So before we get started, I would like us all to take a deep breath and then blow it out. We're gonna go ahead and get started with um, our circle. Please continue to uh, chat in the circle. We're all here for you and we'll lean on each other during this time. So anytime you feel the need to express yourself, please do. Uh, so are we ready staff? All right. Um, here's our first question. How do we address the fear of the unknown? How do we continue to have faith and believe in justice when justice is not served? Ray, you wanna answer this one? You have two minutes. Sure. How do we continue to have faith and believe in justice when justice is not served? I was born into justice not being served. Emmett Till's family lived three blocks from my parents when he was brutally murdered in Mississippi on August 28, 1955. My mother was nine months pregnant at the time. I was born eight days later, September 5th, 1955. I would later walk by that house twice a day going to and from school. While I was in high school, there was a detective unit led by John Byrd that was accused of torturing over 200 innocent men of color in order to force false confessions. In 2014, the Better Government Association reported that the city of Chicago had spent more than a half a billion dollars related to police misconduct in just 10 years. 55 million was contributed to John Byrd. The Declaration of Independence declared that all men are created equal. My people were not, not included in that definition of all. How do we continue to have faith and believe in justice when justice is not served? How do we address the fear of the unknown? First Corinthians 13, and now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of all is love. I have faith in God, we know by many names, 
I have faith that God inspires all people to righteousness and that somehow, some way, righteousness will prevail in God's way and God's time. I have hope in the ability of believers and non-believers to be righteous and to do the right thing when called upon or when they see wrongs being committed. And I have love for mankind in my country. Wow. Thank you, Ray. Dan, how do you feel about this question? Sure, thank you. So I think this these are great questions. Um, so for the first one, I think, um, how do we address the fear of the unknown? I think it's really important to start with our, myself. So I ask a lot of questions. So I try to find people that are similar to me who I trust and ask questions about their experiences. I focus on the positive and ask for times when they gained a healthy understanding about a different group of people or what was an experience where a common stereotype was disproven. Um, it was really important when I understood through um, doing some of the racial healing work through Faith in Place that it's not people's duty who have less privilege than me to help educate myself as they might have trauma and they live the effects of systemic racism every day. So it's not always healthy for them to be my guide. I shouldn't just like run out and try to find people of color in my life and ask them questions. It should really start with myself first. Another good way to ask questions, believe it or not, is to do internet searches. If you're really new to the, um, you know, the realm of all this, white, uh, white privilege and systemic racism are good places to start to get a basic understanding. I always say it's good to participate in racial healing circles, um, as well as if you're in Illinois, you can contact ECOMA or Faith in Place to have a healing circle uh, for your group. And I say it's really important also to know um, myself um, and ask myself questions about my own privilege and where I stand, where when I start to know, you know, where I've been and, you know, the opportunities that I've had that other people haven't had, I can then have empathy and not fear for others when I can see the opportunities that I've had versus what others might not have had. And then the last thing I would say is participate actively participate in racial healing discussions, discussions. And what's also important is to ask other people to join you. Um, I think I'm at my two minutes. I had another one for another answer for the other one. If I could just say quickly, um, as far as to have faith and believe in justice, I would say that there's so many situations that we never hear about, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, would we have heard of George Floyd if that strat if that um, tragedy was not videotaped and made public? Probably not. Um, how many other George Floyd and Trayvon Martin events are there each year? I have faith in justice because people are not being quiet anymore and are drawing attention to the systemic racism that is rampant in our country. People of privilege are taking notice and are joining the cause for justice. The more that we take honest self inventories and talk about what uh, the more likely it is we will see changes in justice over time. I do believe that it's not always present, but the actions of the world do, do bend towards justice over time. We see things changing slowly as in the George Floyd trial. Years ago, the officer would have gotten off, but now we see some justice in the guilty verdict. I think events like this serve as teaching moments for people, for many people, of what's not acceptable anymore. And the future is now different and more just as a result. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Ray. Yeah, um, so I thank God for technology because, you know, like Dan said, more things are being highlighted um, in, in social media and on the internet and people are able to have access to these stories. Um, and see it going on in all over the world, really. Um, for those of you watching, I would like you to answer this question for a few moments. Um, you can journal this question or you can go ahead and put your response in the chat. How do we address the fear of the unknown? How do we continue to have faith and believe in justice when justice is not served? Please, for those of you watching, let's respond to this for a few minutes. Acknowledge our fear, support each other in our feelings. Pray.
speak the truth in love. We can try to believe that love is true is the true core of all humans. Risk, focus on oneness. They say love and fear. Sorry, I lost that one. Speak up and speak out when you see injustice. Be true to your own feelings. Don't give up. Fight to hold on to hope. Find community and do not go it alone. Absolutely. Please continue to drop your responses in the chat as we uh, move on to our next question uh, with Jenny and Veronica. So our next question is, talk about an ancestor who has influenced or shaped you and if they were in the room right now and in this moment, what wisdom would that ancestor offer you? Jenny, would you like to start? Two minutes. Thanks, Isioma. The ancestor I wanna share with you all is my wonderful dad, Bob Judd, who died last year. His family was the most important thing to him. He had two older twin brothers and a younger brother, all of whom he was close to throughout their lives. He was in the Navy in World War II. After the war, he found a job at Sears Roebuck and Company where he worked his whole career. He met my mom at a church dinner after the war and they were married for over 70 years. As I said, he was very devoted to his family and valued those relationships, the most important in his life. He was also interested in the people he met, whether at the fitness center, the local Walgreens, the coffee shop in our town, the staff at his various medical providers, or when on occasion he would have an extended stay in the hospital or rehab after a fall. He learned everyone's name and remembered them. And if he detected an accent, wanted to know their story. How had they come to the US? Did they know English before they arrived or was it part of their challenge in getting used to this country? How had they found work? He valued everyone he met, he let them know it, and he valued their stories. In the last couple of years of his life, he started sharing family history stories by email to his kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, and anyone else who learned of his email list and wanted to be added to it. He had been an enthusiast, enthusiastic genealogist for many, many years, long before the days of internet searches and ancestry.com. He also learned that people want to know more about their ancestors than just when and where they lived and died. So my dad drew on his research to share stories of his and my mom's family's ancestors. And these stories are what he shared by email multiple times every month. If my dad were here right now, he would offer this. Treasure your family, value your friends, and respect the dignity of every human being. Maintain those relationships and mend any that are broken. I'm so thankful he was in my life for so many years. Thank you so much, Jenny, for sharing. Veronica, would you like to go next? Uh, yes. Um, I wanted to start by saying that I was born one year and two days before Emmett Till was murdered. I was born August 30th, 1954. He was murdered August 28th, 1955. Um, I have two people that I wanna lift up simultaneously. My father, who I lost about 23 and a half years ago, and my paternal grandmother, his mother, that I lost at the age of 13. These two people, even in death have influenced my life. They both reigned of dignity, class, eloquence, education. They were well read. We had encyclopedias. My grandmother had a piano and she could play it. She had a beautiful voice. And my dad apparently inherited her voice as well. I thought he was Nat King Cole and I thought she was Mahalia Jackson. When I would hear them on the radio as a little girl living in the Grady 
projects in Atlanta. Both of them overcame racial bar barriers despite uh, Jim Crow and sharecropping. And my grandmother actually picked cotton. My uh, grandmother was a wonderful seamstress in Atlanta, Georgia. When she left Anniston, Alabama, she went to Atlanta where my dad and us as young children and my mother soon followed. And she had, she was the first African-American woman with a drapery shop. And she also was a seamstress and people would with no pattern and she would make beautiful clothes. The story goes, a white interior decorator female spotted her work, hired her to do um, some curtains, some drapes in the governor's mansion at the time that this particular woman had been hired to do. And the governess was so enthralled with my grandmother's work and design that she hired her to do a bedroom for her. Um, of course, my grandmother never got any credit for that, but the family knows the story and we wear it with pride. Dad, on the other hand, was the only African-American in missile school. And he endured quite a bit of racial discrimination and verbal abuse uh, from his classmates but he propelled to the top of the graduating class and won the respect of all of them and became and was assigned to be the captain of that particular platoon. And what I learned from them, no one can take away your dignity unless you give it to them. If they was here right now, they would still say to us, dignity, integrity, honesty, is what we're all about and what we need. They love family more than anything. And more importantly, they taught us about justice. They also taught us that we mattered. I was taught to look people in the eye, to speak up, to never bow my head in servitude, um, that I would risk giving away my dignity and my self-esteem. So I, I, I sit here today and I pay homage to them and all the many elders that many of us as African-Americans who heard the same things around our dinner table, get a good education. If no one can take that from you. And that's the wisdom that they offered. Uh, somehow they knew that education and having dignity and respect would be the things that would get us through despite systemic racism. Wow. That's powerful. Thank you, Veronica. We have uh, a few minutes now. We wanna hear from all of you. Talk about uh, an ancestor who has influenced or shaped you. And if they were in the room right now and in this moment, what wisdom would they offer you? So those of you watching, please write your responses in your journal or in the chat. Someone says, never give up no matter what you are facing. I like that. Have pride in yourself and be willing to stand your ground. Be honest to yourself, always, Ellen. Trust in God, trust yourself, and work, work to make a place better than you found it. I've heard that one before. So true. Yeah, my grandfather, retired school teacher, first showed me how schools in Cleveland were segregated and how people were standing up against racism. Wow. That's amazing. No one can take your dignity away unless you give it to them. Education is still a ticket, and many of the oppressed must use to journey through this racist society. That's a great quote. All right, we're gonna move on now to our last question uh, with Carla and Cindy. Uh, so share a story about a time in your life when you wanted and needed to feel seen, heard and understood and you actually were. How did this experience impact you? How did this experience inspire you to make sure others also felt this way? Carla, would you like to go first? Yeah. Um, when I was trying to think of a story, 
there's a couple, but one that really did stood out for me was um, my junior year of college. Um, just as a background, I am a first generation college graduate. Um, I am Latina. My mom is from Me um, Honduras. My dad is from Mexico. Um, and I'm also the oldest child. Um, so meaning I have to figure out and navigate these white spaces, higher education, pretty much on my own. Um, and it was very difficult. Um, and it was a learning experience, not just for myself, but also with my family and my younger sister. Um, and the time that I remember is my junior year. I just came back from study abroad. I was honestly, I was mentally exhausted because of the figuring out what I wanted to do in life career wise or just being in all these clubs um, and wanting to be the best self so that I can present myself and be prepared to, for what's after college of course um, and so I, I was just tired I was I was just exhausted I did not know how to say no and I just did not know how to ask for help I'm very stubborn um, in that aspect and I think um, junior year was definitely a point where I was also suffering some mental issues, uh, not mental, like I was suffering um, with some health issues. And so I just really was so burnt out. And one of my professors, I love her so much, she took me to the side to her office and she closed the door and she just like sat me down. She's like, Carla, what's going on? And that is when I was just like started crying um, because I, I was afraid to speak up. I was afraid to just tell people that I'm struggling. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how to do certain things or just how to say no um, and just take care of myself. And so when that professor actually just like sat me down, I think that was my, my awakening and my understanding. I have to learn how to do these things and it's okay. I need to take care of myself in order to do what I have to do, but also, look around and help other people when I can because if you don't take care of yourself you can't take care of other people um and so I think that that's definitely an experience that I'm still learning today how to take care of how what is self-care what is um like my community members the people that are around me um, my support system they do care and they want to help me in all these all all that I have right and it's in order to succeed and just be happy of course um and so I whenever I am in the right headspace, I always like to check in with other people. And I think that's something that we need to do. Check in with yourself, but check in with your peers and with your coworkers and the people around you um, in order to support them. Because that that reaching out is something that maybe stop that person needs because they just cannot say, they cannot say, uh, say what they have to do because they might be afraid or they just feel that they just, you might not have the time to, to help them out. Um, so I think that that is definitely it. after that I just again that professor always helped me throughout my college career um, and I always thank her whenever I email her and such but I think that's that's definitely um, a little story a little snippet of like how how I was able to overcome that and just continue doing what I have to do in undergrad. Thank you Carla. Cindy. Same question for you as well. Three minutes. Thanks so much, Isioma. Um, I want to I want to tell you a little story, and it's happened quite recently when I felt like I was really uh, seen and heard uh, and understood. But the the incident that prompted that. Uh, happened many, many years ago. So like this is a long, long time ago at the very beginning of my professional career when I uh, had was just starting out and I uh, had this uh, interview for a very plum position uh, that would really have launched me off well. And I really nailed that interview. It was great. And then as I was just sitting at the very end of it, the person who was interviewing me made a wildly inappropriate uh, um Yes, an inappropriate comment about uh, sex, and and uh, it was just so odd. And I, it was a million years ago. I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know how to respond to it. I didn't know who to tell. There was nobody to report it to, and so all I had was a story. This little story about how that had happened to me, and I told this story through the years and um, every once in a while, and uh, notice that people usually responded in one of four ways. One thing they would say, oh, he must've been kidding. 
they would dismiss it or they would say, oh, that's so awful. And they'd be all mad and, and uh, what's the pe wrong with people? And they'd react with a lot of anger and, and rage or, or they uh, would tell me what I should have done. That was really helpful, especially after 20 years had passed. Well, you should have done this or you should have said that or something. Um, or they would say, um, really? Well, wait till you hear what happened to me. And then they'd tell me something. Um, so I just kind of, I tell the story, but those were the responses I always expected. And very recently I had the occasion to tell that story again to Isioma. And she said to me something quite different from any of that. She said, oh, Cindy, I'm sorry that happened to you. And it stopped me in my tracks because I wasn't expecting that, but it made, it, it was an, perfect response to me because it said uh, that it wasn't right. She said, I'm sorry, it wasn't right, uh, that it happened, that she believed that the experience was real and that it happened to me, that it was really my experience to deal with, to respond to, to, to make sense of. And I think that uh, when she said that, it made me think less about that experience, but more about how I respond when people tell me things that have happened to them uh, when they tell me what they've gone through because of racism or injustice or uh, the, the way things are. I want to respond not as a person of privilege who can rush in and fix things or has the right answer. Uh, I need, I want to respond by saying, I, I, I hear you, I, I connect with what you're saying and believe that situation, but, but more I want to say I believe you and I want I want to connect to you and let you know that you can take the lead and to respond to that to let me know what comes next for you the meaning is yours so thanks Isioma <laughs> thank you very much wow oh I think that's such an important question so it'll really the reaction you'll get from people when you ask that question first or not let that question respond to that um, their story first with I'm sorry that happened to you try it and see what it what it does for you uh, so now we're going to spend a few moments with the audience to respond to this question please share a story in the chat I'm going to give you just a few moments to respond to this All right. If you put in your responses in the chat, with the few minutes that I have left, I want to ask those of you who participated in the circle, one or two of you, to please answer um, this follow up question, which is when you read these questions, how did it make you feel? And when you read it out loud, how did that make you feel? Or answer, uh, whose story tonight, uh, after hearing it, stood out to you, and who do you want to uplift? Anyone wants to start? I'll go, Isioma. This is Veronica. Um, for me, all of them. Because every time I hear these stories, um, Isioma, I, it reminds me that um, I'm okay. I'm okay with how I feel. I'm okay with my pain. I'm okay that I'm sick and tired. Um, that um, what I'm experiencing in my body, sometimes my mind and spirit is relevant and that um, I mustn't give up seeking justice, you know, and a level of real emancipation for myself and my people, my community. So it was everyone's story. I, I, I was touched by them all. I found myself being drawn and connecting to, to every last one of them. Um, it was just really important. And when I even listening to um, Carla's story, um, journeying with my husband who has been ill, and all of a sudden, my you know, 
five of my sister friends from all over the country show up at my doorstep and sweep me away to an Airbnb and treat me to things that I was exhausted and needed. Um, I felt affirmed, I felt heard, I felt understood that despite the rock that I had to be for my husband, my family. So I was, I was touched by all of them. They all touched me, the bitter ones and the sweet ones tonight. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, Veronica. Anyone else want to respond or respond to what Veronica just said? I see it, Cindy. I see it. <laughs> I will say that from the very beginning when, when Ray uh, shared his story and the resources that he found in the, his faith and, and, the, and his community around him, I thought that that sort of, um, it, it's because we do live this life in community with uh, the history of those who've gone before us uh, that we are able to, to keep moving and to, to be okay even when we aren't okay. Uh, so I'm really grateful for that, for being part of this community. Thank you, Cindy. Anyone else? Elena says, Ray's story really stuck a chord in me. I love everyone's courage to share. Me too. It takes a lot. It also takes a lot to listen. Because usually people listen to react instead of listening to respond. Carla's advice to check in with people around you is a great one. Absolutely, especially if you're strong friends, you know, the warriors, the ones that are always on the front lines, the one that never acts like anything's wrong, check on them. I'm that strong friend. So I know that checking matters. And it doesn't have to be anything long, it could be short. Or if you hear someone's aggression or in their, in their day, that there's, when they tell you about their day, stop for a minute and just ask them, are they okay? So you, you tell people, are you okay? Let's forget about what happened today. Are you okay? The whole point is to let people leave you replenished and refreshed. So asking those questions are so important. And then respond to their, their story if you feel the need. Well, thank you all for joining in on the conversation. Uh, please use these questions um, and this type of activity to uh, do something similar in your lives with the people around you. So I wanna thank everyone for joining us in our healing circle tonight. This practice has been important in our community and my hope is that you take away some of what you've witnessed tonight outside of this protective space. And if you would like to host a healing circle with your community or your house of worship, feel free to reach out. We can find out details on how to connect. You can find out details on how to connect through the link. Uh, so before we close tonight, we are going to take a moment and connect the racial healing work that we've done uh, with healing circles to climate. Uh, so as the energy and climate change coordinator, I understand the urgent need to address the climate crisis as well as heal the communities of color that are most impacted. Uh, I believe that it is my vocation and my position as a black woman in this field 
to continue the conversation, both in my professional and personal life. It's become a part of who I am um, and I'm all right with that. At Faith and Pliss, we are very intersectional in the way we view and address the climate crisis, as a lot of you may know. And Leah Thomas talks about intersectionality and environmentalism as a type of environmentalism that advocates for the protection of both people and planet. It's more of an inclusive version of environmentalism that identifies the ways in which injustices are happening to marginalized communities and to the earth. We are all interconnected. So it brings injustices done to the most vulnerable communities and the earth to the forefront and doesn't minimize our silence, societies, and equality. We're going to take a few minutes to explore this idea through a video our team made to help connect the dots between racial justice and climate um, and share the key ways you and your community can take action today to heal our environmental crisis. So let's watch this. Centuries of racism, domination, and extraction have created painful impacts across the globe. Today, our Mother Earth cries out to us as she warms, as her ecosystems break down, and as her forests and oceans are polluted and destroyed. Today, marginalized communities cry out for justice as they fight for existence and cultures that dehumanize them. Our Earth is crying out for healing. Our communities are crying out for healing. Around the world, scientists agree that climate change is threatening our food systems, water supply, economies, and cultural identities. The communities least responsible for the climate crisis are the ones most harshly impacted by its effects. Communities of color and lower income communities face more challenges in building climate resilience. That's why, together, we must act for environmental justice, so the communities bearing the worst impacts of climate change are invested in and protected as our Earth warms. Environmental justice means our solutions to climate change deal with the injustices certain communities experience as they face the climate crisis. These injustices include less support when storms and heat waves hit, limited investments in flooding prevention, a lack of access to cooler, greener spaces and air conditioning, and higher rates of air pollution, making it hard to breathe. Those of us who are privileged to live in communities where a lack of housing and food, pollution and heat don't threaten us, can forget how our neighbors are experiencing the dangerous impacts of climate change already. That is why, as we work to heal the earth, we must also uplift the voices of marginalized communities and provide a protective space for all people to join in on the conversation. Together we can seek justice as we embody compassion in our lifestyles and our advocacy. Together we can heal ourselves, our communities, and our Mother Earth. Here are just a few ways to get started on combating the climate crisis. One way is by saving energy through increasing energy efficiency in your home, place of work, or house of worship. Reducing energy consumed reduces the amount of fossil fuels burned, lessening our impact on the climate. In fact, energy efficiency is so important that it is one of the key United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Faith in Place works with houses of worship and individuals to share tips on reducing energy use. Here are a few ways to get started. Information on all of the ideas shared will be linked in the chat. 
One way is to check out our free energy savings guide for tips on increasing energy efficiency in your home. And if you live in Illinois, you can reach out for a free energy audit for your house of worship and check out our videos explaining how to sign up for smart pricing energy programs, including hourly savings and peak time savings on our website. Faith in Place also works on a macro level to advocate for policies that support climate justice. If you live in Illinois, we invite you to sign the petition for climate justice in our chat or reach out and host a Faithful Citizens Workshop with your house of worship or organization. This workshop is a time when our policy team shares legislative updates and tips for advocating with your representatives. If you live outside of Illinois, check out our Summit Partners page to find an organization working for climate justice near you that you can support. We have all witnessed the historic numbers of heat waves, floods, droughts, and storms disproportionately impacting communities of color across the globe. Now it is time to heal and act. Now is the time to create a healthier and more just future. Join us as we create a more resilient tomorrow. Good evening, everyone. I hope you found the video informative and the healing circle meaningful. My name is Samantha Miller, and I am Faith in Places Energy and Climate Change Support. One part of my job is to connect our community with ways they can conserve energy, protect our climate, and save money. I want to take a moment as our session draws to an end to highlight some of the resources mentioned in the video and add some additional ways you can con continue to heal with the resources and ideas shared tonight. All the resources I review will be linked in the chat. First, if you are interested in hosting a racial healing circle like the one we part participated in tonight, we invite you to reach out to Isioma, who would love to bring that experience to your community. We also have resources and articles on the intersection between race and the environment linked for you. And if you want to empower your community to get more involved politically, we invite you to host a Faithful Citizens Workshop. This workshop will connect you with our policy team who teaches your community how to take political action to support policies that embody justice. We also have lots of tools to help you save energy or transition to solar. You can learn about the Illinois Solar for All program as as well as the support we provide for Houses of Worship transitioning to solar on our resource, resource page. There you will also find videos explaining how Illinois residents can save money and energy through smart energy pricing programs. And to increase efficiency, we have an energy saving guide which anyone can use and we offer free energy audits for Houses of Worship in Illinois. And for all of you, looking for more ways to get involved with climate justice, we have a petition for Illinois residents linked in the chat. And if you are outside of Illinois, please check our partners page and find an organization nearby that you can connect with. For these resources and more, check out the resource page linked. And if you have any questions, we would love to be in touch. I'll now turn the floor over to Valerie Scarbeck, who will close us out. Thank you, Samantha, and uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Valerie Scarbeck. I'm a development officer with Faith in Place. I hope you found this session as meaningful as I did. Um, as we close tonight, I want to share a quote from um, Ruth King, who is a Buddhist racial healer who wrote the book, Mindful of Race. Ruth says, don't be afraid of getting your heart broken. Do your work, say your prayers, then do your best. Grieve, rest, keep hate at bay, and join with others for refuge. 
don't get too don't get too far ahead of now. This moment is enough to digest. Sit, breathe, open. Don't be a stranger to moments of freedom that may be flirting with you. Allow racial distress to teach you to be more human. Sit in the heat of it until your heart is both warmed and informed. Then make a conscious choice to be a light. May we understand and transform racial habits of harm. May we remember we belong to each other. May we grow in our awareness that what we do can help or hinder racial well being. May our thoughts and actions reflect the world we want to live in and leave behind. May we heal the seeds of separation inherited from our ancestors in gratitude for this life. May all being, without exception, benefit from our growing awareness. May our thoughts and actions be ceremonies of well being for all races. May we honor being diverse racial beings among the human race and beyond. May we meet the racial crises of the world with as much wisdom and grace as we can muster. My thanks to Ruth King for that uh, beautiful reflection, which is perfect for tonight. But now I'm actually excited to invite you to continue with us on this Rooted for Healing journey with our next session, Healing with Food. Doesn't that sound great? It will start at 6.30 p.m. Central Time, and we will get to virtually tour the urban farm, Sola Grazia. We'll meet urban farmer, Tracy Barkley, and we'll learn about plant-based soul food cooking with Chef T of Majani Restaurant. Later tonight, we'll close the summit from 8 to 8.45 p.m., also Central Time, by gathering for our last session, Healing Practices. There will be four inspiring breakout rooms with different healing practices, and you can, enjoy, you can join the one that piques your interest. We even have one with bedtime eco stories for children, which is actually great for adults and children alike, but please bring your little ones if you can. Thank you again to our summit's headline sponsor, National Resources Defense Council, and this session sponsor, Illinois Environmental Council. You can meet all of our sponsors and summit partners on our website, greenteamsummit.org. Now, donations from sponsors and individuals like you allow us to offer this summit programming for free to everyone. We are at 95% of our fundraising goal for this event. So I'm hoping you can consider helping us reach the finish line by making a donation of any amount, anything will help us by visiting our website, faithinplace.org and you click on donate. Thank you, especially from the development department. department. Um, I also wanna remind you that you can win a $100 gift card to Earth Hero, which is a really cool online market working to create a healthier planet by completing our sponsor passport you complete our sponsor passport or our summit survey to get a chance to win a gift card is what I'm trying to say there. Um, you can learn more through the info that's in the chat. Now we know it's dinner time, so be sure to bring a snack to the next session, which is healing with food. And I look forward to seeing you there at 6.30 p.m. Now, please enjoy our break, which is brought to you by our sponsors, Citizens Utility Board, Elevate, Advocate Aurora Health, Faith and Health Partnerships, and Environmental Law and Policy Center. Thank you so much and see you soon. <laughs>